On December 31st, 2019, the World Health Organization was officially informed of pneumonia-like cases originating in Wuhan, China. It would become known the world over as COVID-19. Adjusting to this pandemic would change every facet of our lives. A worldwide experience unprecedented in modern times. Or was it? Just over a century before, Canadian soldiers returning from the trenches of World War I would unknowingly bring home with them a deadly strain of influenza. Unlike recent outbreaks in the late 19th century, this strain was a different beast, with the ability to affect adults in their prime, not just children and the elderly. The strain would become known the world over as the Spanish flu. The similarities between these two pandemics are striking. From the public reaction to containment measures, to the pressure on the scientific community to find answers, a deeper dive into those details is the job of a different documentary. Today, the Costume Museum of Canada explores how these pandemics forever changed the way we dressed as we proudly present Viral Fashion. Fashion uses clothing to create and reveal our identity. So let's begin our exploration into viral fashion with a closer look at what happened when we were asked to cover up our most valuable tool to express our identity, our faces. With both the Spanish flu and COVID-19, initial personal protection equipment reflected our medical understanding at the time. The Alberta Board of Health suggested gauze masks be worn by anyone who encountered soldiers who arrived home with the flu in October of 1918. People without access to multi-layered medical masks were encouraged to make home-crafted creations. This, what I'm showing you, is a 1918 version of the mask. It was made of four layers of material, cotton material, gauze, um, cheesecloth, I believe they called it. And it was often recommended that they were soaked in camphor or um, eucalyptus uh, for medicinal purposes. Doctors recommended, too, that they were burnt after use. It's a little smaller, and it's not quite as stylish as what we have today. Homemade cloth masks were also popular at the beginning of COVID-19. Um, I think the first one I bought was cloth, <laughs> and it had like a nice pattern on it. I guess just as a, as a woman, it made me feel a bit more fashionable and like matched my outfit. But once production made them more readily available, disposable N95 and KN95 masks were recommended as more effective. I used the N95 because I had to travel, but I still do not feel comfortable entering the buses without the mask. So even after the mask mandate ended, I still wear masks sometimes. In both eras, once recommendations were elevated to stronger mandates, masking was met with more resistance. The fashion industry stepped in to help make masking more accepted by the masses. Veiling was massively popular in 1918. Vogue touted it as the only way for a well-groomed woman to finish her outfit. New Jersey department store Haney & Company combined the popularity of a veil's existing Orientalist sensibilities with an endorsement from the local health department. These were for really fashion-forward women in 1918, and they were actually made out of chiffon. So this is a little heavier, and I can hardly see through it. But it feels very mysterious, and it feels like I'm in mourning. Reviews of the flu veil would be reprinted in Toronto and Vancouver, promoting the trend as an opportunity for women to be fashionable with a purpose. In a million years, I would not wear a flu veil. <laughs> like maybe if it was pink, maybe I'd have been more into it. I don't know. During COVID-19, there wasn't one mystic style that would help promote masking. Instead, it was the opportunity to promote your unique style. People, especially at the start of COVID, when like cloth masks were very common, people were wearing so many different ones and it was very interesting. The ones with the animal features, like I, I had the one that had like a tiger and a bear, so it just made you look really cute. <laughs> the people there were wearing like kind of like fishnet masks with sparkles. Oh, yeah. 
the mask became another accessory and another opportunity to express our individuality. My whole family had like embroidered cloth masks and we all had like our own little flower uh, like display on it. And yeah, so it was kind of nice actually being able to individualize. Which mask became part of your viral fashion? The fashion trends that evolved during both the Spanish flu and COVID-19 weren't all born out of the pandemics. Many were an acceleration of trends that already existed at the time. In this episode of Viral Fashion, we'll explore the current events of 1918 and 2019 that were already shaping the clothing we wore. There is no doubt that World War I, which began in July of 1914 and concluded on November 11, 1918, was the largest current event influencing fashion during the Spanish flu. You see a definite military influence. Very often there's a belted style. It was probably loose, but a two-piece outfit with a long skirt and a long jacket really reflected what the military uniforms of that earlier time represented. Very often uh, the shiny look of the military buttons were used as decor in the front of the suits and jackets of the time as well, for men and women both. Women's fashion was more indirectly influenced by the war. Any war requires the civilian population to give up a certain amount. So you could really see the trend toward a more slim down kind of a style, something that would use less fabric, that would use less materials generally as everything went to, uh, to make the country's war effort go properly. In 2019, we weren't at the close of a world war, we were fighting a much vainer war against aging and an ever-expanding waistline. Donning active wear during our after-work hours let everyone know we were fighting the good fight of maintaining our youthful figure. Once all the aspects of life, including work, school, and working out, moved to the isolation of everyone's home bubble, active and loungewear were elevated to our primary clothing. Everyone started going on walks. Suddenly, like, my street was filled with people walking, and it never usually was that busy. We have a big front window, so you see everyone. But at the same time, too, it is quite nice to just wear sweatpants and sweater if you're just running to the store. Oh, I'd say Lululemons. Lots of, constantly. <laughs> After the Spanish flu ended, shorter hemlines became a lasting theme. So our only question now is, will the viral fashion of active and loungewear also have a lasting impact. Influenza and COVID-19 are caused by viruses. In 2020, medical science could identify strains and develop a vaccine. In 1918, that simply wasn't the case. Germ theory was widely accepted knowledge, but we lacked the technology to develop anything more than recommendations and guidelines. In this episode of Viral Fashion, we'll take a closer look at how bundling up became forever associated with flu prevention. Here in Canada, we don't need to be sold on the benefits of having a good winter coat. But when Spanish flu health orders started repeating the importance of staying warm and dry right before the winter of 1918, clothing stores couldn't resist highlighting this new benefit in their marketing. The Boston Clothing Shoe and Hat Store went so far as to feature their overcoats in an ad titled, How to Prevent the Spanish Flu. Well, wrapping up warmly in cool weather was strictly advised during the 1918 Spanish flu pandemic. And wearing the raccoon coat during the winter months kept you warm and helped prevent you from getting sick. The recommendation seemed backed by actual results, but it's more likely the indirect benefit of spending more time outdoors in the open air is the true benefit of a warm coat. Even today, the conflicting opinions about bundling up to battle a fever can be easily found online. It's an accepted home remedy. And many of us were quick to reach for our house coats, sweatpants, and slippers during COVID-19. I splurged on like a really expensive pair of slippers actually within the first few months. For me, a lot more sweaters, different types of sweaters, crew necks, hoodies, quarter zips. So like there were a lot of like sweatpants, skirt, big socks, and like a heated blanket configuration. Sometimes I felt like a little bit like an elderly person, you know, with a blanket tucked around my lap and, and a cup of tea there as I sat there for hours. 
But was it viral fashion because it served a preventative purpose? Or did we just clad ourselves in comfort because we were no longer leaving the house? I think I just got used to seeing a lot of pajama pants in public. <laughs> Living during a pandemic involves coping with constant stress, from minor disruptions of regular routines to ongoing fear of death. In this episode of Viral Fashion, we'll look at how our clothing became a reflection of our need to escape the stress. Many social media memes during COVID-19 lamented, how could 2020 possibly become worse? But if you think we were drowning in disillusionment, imagine if our pandemic followed a four-year world war. In 1918, people were done with death and disease. You can imagine living through times like that. You really needed an escape. So the 20s allowed that. Not only did it allow it, but people took the opportunity to express their joy. So rather than getting the elements of a bodice and a huge skirt, petticoats, all of that, what you got was generally one slip over the head garment. There was either no waist at all or there was a dropped waist and uh, no sleeves or very little sleeve. The dresses were, were so free because the people required them to be free. They needed the freedom that they had been denied during the First World War and during the pandemic when they were so restricted as to what they could and couldn't do. Additionally, Orientalist motifs on light and silky selections allowed anyone who wore them to feel like they were in a faraway place. I had no idea about the Oriental impact from travel during the war, which I think is very fascinating. And I remember that kind of coming through a couple of times as I was growing up. I was born in the 60s. Much like the flapper dresses, these designs inspired by the East combined youthful flair with wishful fantasy. During COVID-19, fun also became harder to find. People had to get more creative with setting up play zones at home. Gatherings and events, if allowed, were restructured around social distancing and frequent sanitizing. Our fashion reflected that creativity with bright colors and funky patterns last seen in these garments from the 90s and 70s. Despite the depressing daily case counts, many looked for outfits that expressed optimism. Casual clothes was fine during the pandemic, but I really like fashion. I like style and I like dressing up. Online shopping and social media were already part of our lives. But the pandemic accelerated everyone to the level of early adapters. Even if we weren't so tech savvy before, we became very good at interacting on Zoom. I know there's lots of older ones at my church that suddenly became like super techy and were calling me and asking me for help because they wanted to talk to other people and they were arranging a little like Zoom tea afternoons. Our social lives moved online and fashion followed. Anyone could launch their fashion trend on TikTok and their followers could wear it for themselves with a click on the online store. The old-fashioned gatekeepers have permanently relinquished control of what comes next. Trends can come from anyone and anywhere. Will this newly found freedom be the lasting viral fashion trend in our post-pandemic world? Worldwide experiences change the human zeitgeist and set us all on a whole new path. In this final episode of Viral Fashion, we'll analyze the most impactful trend of post-pandemic life after Spanish influenza and speculate what could become equally impactful in the years after COVID-19. Before the Spanish flu, heliotherapy, or sunlight therapy, was being used by doctors to treat tuberculosis and rickets. Patients would lay in the sun and let UV rays kill the nasty germs. Now up until this time, tan skin was avoided. Tans would be unfashionable because those were laborers. It was working class, yeah. right? Rich people, they didn't work, so they were pale. The aristocracy, you were able to stay inside and just mm -hmm. like, hide from the sun. Heliotherapy transformed that perception, 
Suntans now indicated healthiness. Not only did tanning take off as a fad, but it also transformed all our clothing to show more sun-kissed skin. This outfit is a swimsuit from the 1910s. It is made of wool, which is quite different from what we see today. Uh, however, it was also a little bit different in the sense that it was more open-sleeved, open-backed, which was uh, quite unusual for the time. Woolen bathing suits gave way to open backs, lowered necklines, and smaller straps. Evening and day wear quickly followed, with cuts that covered unseemly tan lines while showcasing our golden glow. The tanning trend was a shining light on how the influenza pandemic fostered a health consciousness that influenced dress for years to come. That is quite a big change, and especially like with the ideas of modesty of that time period, like now you have the shoulders exposed and the skirt on there is shorter. That is a huge change. I think that's incredible. Yeah, I think it illustrates sort of like a loosening in the how women can display their bodies and take agency of their bodies. They should see the swimsuits today. <laughs> so, what will be the most impactful fashion trend to come out of COVID-19? As we re-entered the public world, many of us stuck with the pieces that comforted us in our bubbles. Offices seeking to entice people away from remote work introduced relaxed dress codes. I work at a, a financial institution, so our dress code is very business, and then what people wear tends to be a little bit under that. I think overall, we tend to look at, at comfort more than we ever did before, and we're more kind of accepting, I think, of people dressing comfortably. A lot of places went work from home, or you know, they, they incorporated casual dress. I think because just in general, we're, we're both more excited to dress up, but also more accepting of comfort in everyday life. Designs like trousers with elasticated waist Bands and knit dresses suggest comfort will come first in our post pandemic world. How did viral fashion affect your work attire? When journalist Leandra M. Cohen asked Lauren Sherman, the New York editor of Business of Fashion, about the purpose of fashion, she eloquently replied The purpose is to negate our persistent fear of death. Decorating ourselves in particular things helps to craft an identity, which creates the illusion of permanency. If we buy things and we define the way we look, it makes our existence feel more real and everlasting. The stronger the threat, the stronger the reaction. It's no wonder both pandemics were the birthplace of clothing trends that simply celebrate life. The Costume Museum of Canada would like to thank all the people that contributed to viral fashion. The researchers. The members of our organization. The models of our fashion shows. And the film crew from Audio Active Advertising. We hope you enjoyed this closer look at viral fashion. For more information about experiencing the live display and our additional exhibits and events, please visit costumemuseumofcanada.com.